in our Battle for Auckland series. I'll just pass over to Cheryl from Parnell, who uh, can't get her camera running, but she is definitely there. Cheryl. Morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of New Markets, Parnell, Ponson BK Road, and the Uptown Business Association. Also, like to welcome members of the media. Um, thank you so much. You've attended all of these, and Mark will introduce you all individually later after Craig has spoken. So in terms of the format, um, Mark Knopf Thomas, um, who's the CEO of the New Market Business Association, will be moderating the session. So please can we ask you to make sure your microphones are on mute and save questions for the end. They've been really interesting for me personally, trying to assess what the candidates will do for our business community. So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Craig Lord. Craig was raised in Putaruru, he moved to Auckland by himself at 15 to start life as an apprentice engineer. Within the 16 years he worked for the company he started with, he went from floor sweeper and parts cleaner to serviceman, workshop foreman, and then general manager. Craig decided to completely change careers in 2003 and went into freelance media covering motorsport in which he used his love for motorsport and his hobby of photography to become a photojournalist for a four-wheel drive magazine. Since then, he's edited international motorsport magazines, produced, co-hosted, and presented on various radio and TV channels, been an MC and commentator for the New Zealand round of V8 supercars for 15 years, plus he's an MC from, been an MC for several other major functions and sporting events. He's been married since 1996 and raised two children. Craig says that Auckland voters need to know they will have a person who will listen to them, appreciate what they have to say, respect what they have to say and bring it to the table, not brush them off. We look forward to hearing from you, Craig. Over to you, Craig. Oh, thank you. I've unmuted now. Oh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, look, it's very, very simplistic of my purpose to run for mayor. I was a disgruntled Auckland citizen, an Auckland ratepayer, who was upset with the way that I felt council was operating, the way they were doing things. And generally, as people do, they either moan about it all the time to each other, or they put up their hand and say, well, let's try and fix it ourselves. So I did back in mid 2018, out of the blue, as in completely unknown, I put up my hand and said, I'll run for mayor. That was a big ask as a, an absolutely unknown entity. But even though the end result was massive in regards to the number of votes, I'm still really proud of what I achieved as an unknown to finish third behind two very big names. So that was my datum. That was my decision point as to whether I would continue this job application through here to 2022. And I think even though, yeah, again, the numbers were, were quite vast, it was enough for me to say I had cut through. I had enough people who did hear my message, who agreed with what I was saying. I'm going to do it again in 2022 and try and get that message out even further because to me, it was a positive result. And that message hasn't changed. It stayed exactly the same right across the last four years. And that's I want council to focus and be a superb supplier of core services. And that's where I think it lacks. I also think it jumps out of its own lane at times and it's doing things it shouldn't be doing because it feels ideology, whatever reasons that it should be doing some things. And those will come out over the next few months. But core services is so important. And to me, that is the basic function of a council. To get that happening, we need a different style of leadership. We need the councillors around the table. You're never going to get 20 and 21, including the mayor councillors to agree on everything. That's never going to happen. But you need a style of leadership that will at least allow everyone to have a voice and make sure that these councillors listen to the community because that's the major feedback. We're not getting that. We're not being listened to. So we have to change that. Now that carries on further because we need to then take that to local boards to make the local boards accountable for what they're doing and make sure they communicate properly to the people. The local boards has to be one of the most horrid jobs in the world because you're the go-between between the general population and the council table. We have to get all that working properly, a, a united front on that. That takes a leadership plan rather than going in as a CEO 
or as a boss, because the most important aspect to remember is the mayor is not the boss of Auckland. And I think that's where a lot of candidates have had it wrong for every election ever. You are not the boss. You are one of 21 votes, but your job is there to provide leadership, to provide some visions and goals, but not tell everyone what you're going to do because that is not how it works. And amongst those things that I want to do to try and get the core services working better is create a core services strategy, a CSS document, because we all know that everyone in politics loves to have the little letters describing things. So a CSS, that does not exist. It's been put forward on the table now and then by a few councillors, but it's been pushed aside. The last one I heard was Greg Sayers wanting it done, and Mayor Goff said, no, we're not going to do that at the moment. I find that a little disturbing that the council doesn't know what a core service is. But that's up to the people because what I might think is a core service, someone else might not. For example, uh, the boy statue in Mount Albert, the mirror over O'Connell Street. To me, those are not core services. Those are niceties, not necessities. People will argue that, they'll debate it, but that's what we have to do. We have to bring all of these different aspects of what a council should be to the table and create the CSS document. From there, the council can function properly. It can do its job, its role of providing that service. One of the things I wanna do though, in fact, two things, and they link in with that core services, is do a full audit of every single department in council. Now that can be done by me, one of the councillors. Um, we might have experts that we can tap on the shoulder who might even volunteer their time for free because they are so desperate to get things working properly. Sometimes we might have to hire a commissioner, someone like a corporate bulldozer who can come in and go, well, hang on, there's way too many middle management in here and it's making it an inefficient department. But anyway, that has to happen through every department, financially and operational wise. The other thing I want to do is create a full rehash, a complete overhaul of our preferred contractors because to me, that's a major problem. We've got a handful of big, big corporate style contractors who are getting all the tenders because they have full-time staff to work the tenders. They're putting the values in, their prices, their tenders, they're getting the jobs, then they're farming it out to all the little people and that gets farmed out again and so on and so on. What we end up with is an inefficient system and a system where there's no pride or quality in the work anymore. And the examples that you find on social media of the contractors who have done a disgraceful job around our city, but they've been paid to do it, but they've been paid a tiny wee amount because the big people up and above, they've got all the money. So we need to completely overhaul the way the preferred contractor system works. One of the things I want to do is have locals working local. Now, there won't always be my area, for example, Blockhouse Bay. There might not be someone in Blockhouse Bay who can lay tarmac on a footpath or can who fix potholes. They might not exist. So we go to another suburb closer over. But if we can overhaul the system, if we can create a warrant of fitness for contractors, if we can help them bypass all the red tape, put in the tenders, if we've got a, a sign or a bollard or, or an armco or a pothole or something or work that needs done in a local area and it's reported into the system and we know we've got this massive list of local contractors who meet the grade, I see no reason why we won't get better quality work because they'll have pride in their local service and for a better price. So what that does is it enables core services, it's spreading the wealth and we're getting a better return on our money. And that's the kicker, because I'm really worried now that this is going to become an austerity problem. And we are all about where we're not going to spend money. I saw the reports yesterday coming out about the new budget and where they're going to cut things. I've been saying that for four years. We've got to cut a lot of things. Now we've really got to cut things. 30 so seconds. What this is going to require, yep. 30 seconds. What this is going to require is someone like me, an engineer, with communication skills through my media work, because engineers, we are very pragmatic. We are common sense only. We know if something's not working and we don't keep doing it because we know it doesn't work. We find solutions to problems. 
That is what we've got to do. That's why my hand was put up. I want to try and make Auckland Council work properly, because if that works properly, the city works properly, and the citizens can get on with their lives. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Craig. Uh, great introduction. So we have a, a media panel with us this morning uh, who have very kindly been taking part in these over the last, uh, the last five weeks. Uh, Simon Wilson from the New Zealand Herald, Todd Nile from Stuff, uh, Brent Melville from Business Desk, and Mark Jennings from Newsroom is uh, hopefully joining us as soon as you can jump on the call. Um, so basically the media will be asking questions of Craig uh, for about four or five minutes, uh, will be timed, and sometimes the time goes over a little bit because the questions may have relevance to what some of our members have been asking of the candidates as well. So we're very grateful uh, to have the media panel. We're very grateful for your time too, Craig. But to start off, I'll hand over to uh, Simon from the Herald to uh, ask you his questions. Thank you, Mark. Kia ora, Craig. Good to see you. You too. Uh, you um, had quite a lot to say in the last election about transport, and I did want to start there. Um, I've asked you in the past about uh, whether you support the proposal for free fares and you don't. You say it's better to make public transport better rather than cheaper. Um, how would you make public transport better? It's a major problem in Auckland and there's no easy answer because of the geographical layout. It, we've sprawled out so much over the last hundred odd years, we've actually created this problem. And to try and solve that is a major issue. I mean, yesterday I was reading that in the budget, they've allocated to improve bus services to 170,000 Aucklanders. But the number beside it, and what they were saying was within 500 metres of a bus stop. And I thought, this is fantastic. This is what we need. And then it said 10% of the population. That's it. This is where it's the an problem extra 10%, is. But yeah. yeah, yeah. This is, this is where the problem is. It's, it's an inefficient system. And to make it efficient means sitting down with a lot of very smart people and a big giant map and going, see this area here? It's not gonna work. The only way to solve public transport in this zone is a scorched earth policy, and that's not going to happen. So we're gonna to have to come up with different solutions. Now that could be maybe going down to the small minivan style that they're testing. I know they're about to test in Pukekohe. I think they've had some on the shore, maybe out east they're doing some as well. It's, I don't think it can be done by modelers with a computer. That's, that's where I also struggle. You get these people sitting there with a laptop and they plan it all out. They're not in the real world. They don't actually go into the streets and go, well, hang on, a bus going through that intersection, that intersection, that intersection, and that's not working. So we're gonna have to come up so, with something else. So what I'm asking you is how you would make it better. You suggested uh, minivans, as you say, they are being trialed. Uh, you su suggested that you need, you need to sit down with a big map and modeling isn't necessarily the answer. I'm not really hearing from you what you would do to make public transport better. Exactly that. We have to plan it out better because at the moment it's not planned. It isn't planned properly at all so, because buses are sporadic in timing. They're inefficient. And every complaint I've had over the last four years on, on email and social media is people saying the bus stops are they're cancelled. I can't get to it. It takes too long to get from A to B. Now that's cool, we get those complaints. So now we have to find the solution. I get what you're asking. There is no quick magic wand fix to this. We have to look at each individual suburb and go, can we put public transport in here? And there's going to be cases where we go, no, I'm sorry, but we can't. This isn't gonna work. And, and unfortunately that's what's gonna happen. Step by step, we have to look at the problem to nail down where it is. Auckland Transport would say that they've got professional planners who are doing this every day. Mm, they would. I'm sure they do. But look at what's happened. They're a disaster. Well, They're an they would argue disaster that, zone. They would argue that COVID aside, uh, public transport use is on the increase, that the bus routes have been refined and refined. The use of the double deckers and the main routes and so on has uh, significantly increased the use of buses. Train services are better. Um, all of those things are underway. I'm, oh, no doubt. But if you go further afield and talk to the general populations in the outskirts and the suburbs that aren't in the main trunk lines, they're all going, we have no public transport. We have inefficient service. We can't get anywhere. I can't go from here to A to B to C and D because it just doesn't work. Now, that's it's because our city of where, not, Do you have an example of where public transport just doesn't work? Yeah, out west. 
you try and get a bus from Kumu, you try and get a bus from Hobsonville, you try and get a bus from Herald Island, all those areas, and then, well, okay. How so the answer to that would be to, set, would be to have a rapid transit bus line on the Northwest Motorway? Which I believe is underway, or the is planning underway. is underway. Yep, is underway. Well, construction is but, underway. But the problem is further out where that really heavy traffic comes from, say Kumu into Westgate, uh, maybe even down the further, it's an absolute disaster because the road there doesn't allow for a bus lane. There's no, at the moment, willingness to put in light rail or rail up there when the, the lines actually exist. So they're not trying to get the people down. And what are they making it worse? Building more houses out there, more sprawl. Tens of thousands of them. So I'm still no trying plan. to get a feel. I'm still trying to get a feel for what you would actually do. Would you put a light rail line out there? No, I would look at putting electric from Henderson. I think it is, or is it next one up Massey, and go up to Kumu Huapai. The rail already exists, and the argument I keep hearing is that the tunnel is a problem. Well, that's a minor fix, isn't it, compared to everything else? That would be so little. And let's get a passenger rail system from way out west into there, then they can jump on the buses, utilise the new system. Right. But each suburb, you... each little area of Auckland needs to be analysed properly. 30 seconds, Simon, 30 okay. seconds. Okay, well, all right, uh, perhaps, perhaps Todd or one of the others will pick this one up. Um, you want council to stop doing the things it shouldn't do. Just tell me what they are. Yeah, as in core services or no, outside... I'm quoting you, we should stop doing the things we shouldn't do. What are they? Uh, wasting money is one of the but biggest things. What are the things? things? What, are the, what are the services? Okay. It's more what isn't a core service rather than what is a service. When they go and make a mirror for $400,000, when they go and put up a boy statue for $800,000, they should not be doing that. They so should not art, be doing public that. Public art would be cut under you. Yes, right now it would be. It could come back. But right now is a completely unglamorous. Okay, point public in art's time. a tiny, tiny pr proportion of the budget. Have yep. you got anything bigger? Yep. Yeah, the preferred contractors, all of that waste of money, the waste of money that happens inside council. I mean, what is it now? 12,000 staff? And how many are actually efficient? We don't know because no one's ever audited it. So, Who's staff to do cuts that? is the issue? No. In fact, you shouldn't increase staff, frontline staff. You might have to decrease middle and upper but you've got to improve the frontline staff. The question like that of, of, of what would we get rid of is too vast because there's, we still don't have a core services strategy. Yet. We've got to define what we think core services are. And then we can look at the other stuff and go, well, that isn't. So why are we doing that? I believe now I read it yesterday out in Franklin. There's a new walk bridge going in. Brilliant because that's needed across, the, across a particular a gully out in Pukekohe. I've got to go back and read the number because I'm sure it said $2 million for a walk bridge. If that's the case and that's been signed off, I think heads should be rolling somewhere because somebody is not doing the due diligence to look at the entire job and go, a $2 million walk bridge across a little gully? Who's ripping off the ratepayer here? Or is that realistic? But until that sort of stuff is done, that's the kind of thing that has to change. We've got to be more aware of where this money is going so that we don't have to cut spending on essential items. Thanks, Craig. Welcome. Thanks, Todd. Okay. Uh, moving on to Todd from, from Stuff. Todd. Uh, morning, Craig. Um, Hi. I, I'm not going to pick up any further on transport, but when you were talking about suburbs that don't have good public transport, I just, you noted a suburb where I lived for 30 years and commuted by bus to the city, which was Kumu, uh, and also Hobsonville Point, where I now live and commuted this morning uh, from Hobsonville Point to the city on bus in 40 minutes, which I thought was pretty good. But anyway, what I wanted to ask you about was, uh, Facebook has been a, a large part of your campaigning, <clears throat> and I'm interested in your use of it, and I've got a couple of questions about it. Your most recent post has a picture of the Mayor, Phil Goff, with the word liar blasted across it. Can you just, I read it, but I didn't get what the lie was. What is the lie that you're referring to there? The lie is that he has said to the public uh, in the media through, through whatever communication that he does not like three waters. He will not agree to three waters. 
yet in the budget, he'd already, while he was saying that, he'd already allocated the 500 million payout into the budget, which I think I read, when did that come out? January, February, I think the pre prelim of that came out and I read it in there. And when I see one person saying one thing and then doing another, that's speaking with a forked tongue and that's lying to the general population. It's not acceptable. But both of those things are true and have been known publicly for over six months that the mayor didn't like aspects of three waters, mm -hmm. but that if it went ahead and the money came, it would go into the budget. I don't see what the lie is. The lie is that he is doing one thing and saying another. I, I can't, I can't elevate any more on that. It's it's what it is. In terms of how you would conduct yourself as mayor, when I look at your mm. Facebook campaign, you quite often have posts that look sort of innocuous, but spark, you know, comments that are probably offensive and may go beyond that, and you don't seem to contest them. For example, you put up a post the other day, I guess in time with Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister, getting an honorary doctorate, noting that in 1996, Kermit the Frog received an honorary doctorate. And then there was a stream of comments there that people might have considered offensive, but you seem happy to allow them to continue and be hosted. Yes. Free speech. I will not stifle people's speech. If it crosses into hate speech, I remove it, if I see it. If people want to give their opinion, whether it's good or bad, that's up to them, and that is not my job to say, oh, you can't, you can't say that. I don't do that. People are allowed to say what they want. Again, if they cross over into hate speech, then I've got a problem with them, and I have done that. I've banned plenty of people when they cross over into that line. On one of your posts, this is getting away from that topic now, sure. you said we don't need a lot more roads. So mm. where would you as mayor stop the road building? On day one or after all the current projects are built, where would you draw the line? We need, when it, yeah, yeah, a couple, I actually noticed a couple of people saying, no, you're wrong, we need Mill Road and we need, yeah, that I wasn't, we don't need any roads, we just don't need a lot more roads. So we do need a handful of very specific ones. I think the, the Kumu bypass, which I believe is back on the table now, needs to be done. They need to fix the, and I always get Mill and Hill around the wrong way from Walkworth and, and, and out south. Those need to be fixed. So those, those have to be done. They're, they're essential because they're creating major problems. Aside from Apart that, from that no more? I, I don't see any reason to have any more, no. Not at this stage. And one last one, you made a comment that uh, Auckland Transport was under orders from NZTA and the Labour government to purposely mm -hmm. create congestion. Was that tongue in cheek or? Nope, true? nope. I've actually got a certified letter where um, the boss of Auckland Transport has said that at a meeting. It has been notarised and I may or may not put it up on social media. So it, it is true. They are purposely creating constriction and congestion to get people out of their vehicles. And it's it's a terrible, and I think it was, God, with all the COVID happening, I, I lose track of the timeline, but it might've been mid last year when NZTA, their spokesperson was at a meeting and admitted that part of the slowdown is to create congestion to get people out of their cars, to, to frustrate them and force them out. It, it might've been the year before, but it wasn't too far ago. Okay, thanks Craig. Mark, I wonder if I could, I, I know this isn't the, the form, but Craig just said something that is quite disturbing to me, that he has a letter from the Chief Executive of Auckland Transport that he says shows that Auckland Transport is subverting the policy, both the, the Chief Executive is subverting the, subverting the policy of both Auckland Transport and Waka Kotahi. We need to see that letter, Craig. You can't yep, just no make problem. that accusation and then not present it. No, no, no problem. I can send it on, yeah. Quite happy to. So was it by was it by the chief executive or about the chief executive? Uh, I'd have to open it up on the computer and confirm that, and I'll come back to you with that. But I'm sure it was the CEO. Yes, I'll, I'll send it on to you guys. No problem. Thank you. That's our stopper there. So <laughs> thank you for those questions, there, Todd. Uh, now I'll uh, Brent from Business Desk would like to ask a couple of questions too. Hi, Craig. Hi. Yeah, that was an interesting comment on the on um, on Shane Ellison's 
Uh, that was Shane, obviously, you were, you were referring to. I think, it was, yeah, yeah, sorry, I've just lost the names at the moment, but yeah. Okay. I mean, you made some comments to me on, on congestion. I certainly don't follow the lining, the line you just you just mentioned. But um, I'm interested in your comment on overhauling contractors, uh, mm. and sort of locals for locals. Um, you talk about engineering solutions. It sounds like social engineering on that one. I mean, how do you conceivably see that working in a kind of a suburban context? I mean, you're going to fix potholes with local contractors. It sounds like a, a seriously unmanageable kind of scenarios how do you how do you see that rolling out i see it completely utterly the opposite a perfect example is back in 2018 when i was having a meeting in walkworth with the with the voters up there and we were talking about how things get done because of course way up there they're upset with auckland city they just they want to be their own world up there and, and there's arguments for and against but they were talking about contractors and one of the ones they said to me was a preferred glazier contractor who has to repair the glass in the council owned buildings up there comes from South Auckland. Now that's a major problem. And that's because that's the person in the system. So we need to change the system because no one can tell me there's no glaziers up in Walkworth, Wellsford or anywhere up there that couldn't meet our health and safety standards, meet our warrant of fitness requirements to be at the grade we want them to be to provide services and fix the glass up there and save us how much? probably a, a, a fortune because the cost to repair a window when they've got to travel a couple of hours and then do the job. So that's one example. I see no reason why local contractors cannot work locally. Absolutely none at all. Okay. How do you, um, do you have any ideas around supporting small business uh, within the city? In the CBD or Auckland? Uh, wider, wider regional. Again, I believe, well, I believe that the council, again, is all about core services. If you get the council working properly to make the city function properly, then everybody can go around and do their own business properly, whether that be a private person or whether it be a small, medium or large business. If we make Auckland efficient, make it a workable city so that people can get around, people can do whatever they want to do, that is how you support the businesses. It's up to businesses to run themselves, but we've got to provide the core services to them to allow them to do it. You're um, you're not a political animal. Um, oh no, well, maybe you are. But uh, where do you see your support base uh, this coming election? And um, when you get in, how how do you see your relationship with government? Um, or how do you how do you support? How do you see us strengthening it? So support base, you mean, where do I think my votes will come from? Yes. I suspect centre-right majority would be that. I can't imagine too many from the left-leaning ideology would want to support many of the things that, that I do. Um, there's nothing I can do about that. It's just who I am. It's, that's my beliefs. Um, so I think that's where they'll come from. In regards to working with central government, it's purely communication, isn't it? There's, there's nothing more that can be done. Um, I think going in like a bulldog, banging a table is the wrong move. We have to uh, sit down and be amicable, common sense, offer strategies, discuss it. But it's also up to the other councillors around the table to support the mayor on this. Uh, and, and everybody has to be part of that. And you come up with strategies, you might want something. Let's say it's a CBD police station, for example. We have to lobby central government to get that to happen. So that's what we do as a combined group around that table of 21. We work out how we're going to lobby government government to make that happen. So it's, it's I, I, I don't think there's any, I can elaborate any more on that. It's just the way you approach and talk to people, isn't it, really? And then my final question, um, and it's kind of my go-to with everybody else. Uh, how, what's your view on the port solutions there? You think it needs... Okay. Some development. Yep. Um, it's it's a it's an argumentative one. My, my belief in it. I believe it should stay there. I believe Auckland is a port city. We trade. We need the ports to do our job. Uh, we can freight the containers out by train. The lines exist. I don't know why we keep putting trucks in and out of there. But also speaking with some people who are ex-ports, they have serious worries about the way the port is now currently run. They believe it's gone back to the old days of the 70s, even earlier, with uh, unionisation, and that's causing a lot of issues and a lot of 
the port to not work as well as it should do. A lot of the automation is still not up and running. So it's just not efficient. Maybe we've got to bring in some of the people from overseas who work on the really, really massive ports to just come and have a little audit and go, well, why are you doing this and why aren't you doing that? But anyway, in, in the short run, I believe it should stay there because I believe, me personally, that Auckland is a trading port city. And under council ownership? Yeah, why not? I see no reason to change that. If we can make it an efficient business the way it should be, uh, then by all means, we should keep it, yeah. Hey, unless some there's some big economic guru comes in and says, no, nah, it's not going to work, then okay, explain to me why and let's go through the numbers. Thank you. That's me, Mark. Sorry, that was embarrassing after two years of COVID. I should not be doing that right now. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Brent. Um, we have a, a theme of questions. We've been sort of asking the various candidates, Craig, and uh, largely similar themes each week. Each week. Obviously, for um, a lot of our town centres, including many on this call, we've got Ponsonby, K Road, um, Uptown, Parnell, and Newmarket on this call at the moment. Uh, crime has become a, a, a really you know, major feature of our day-to-day -day, uh, happenings, unfortunately. And it hasn't suddenly happened despite you know, a sudden focus on it, but actually it's been going for a wee while. What more do you think, and this, this really goes back to your core services theme, your CSS, um, strategy. What, what more do you think council could do to help uh, town centres in this area? And I say in this area, sorry, in this area, not the central area, but in the area of crime. Okay. Uh, firstly, as much as people don't want to hear it, uh, crime is concerning, but not the council's problem. That is a policing problem for central government. So what can the council do to help? We could make it a lot easier for businesses to put security in, so if they want to put in bollards, then we make sure that it's cheap and simple and easy for them to have all the subservices, the underground stuff checked and analyzed to say, yes, you can put bollards in here if you wish to. So we streamline that service for them. So they're not forking out thousands and thousands of dollars in permits and analysis on the ground. That's just one thing. Whether they might want to put up some security in their own businesses, We've got to make sure that it's easy for them to do that internally. Again, cutting the red tape, making sure it still fits with the needs of the city, though, because you can't have people putting up a big concrete fort in front of their store. That just isn't going to work. Then you've got safe streets, and that could be nighttime stuff. So it's up to the council again to make sure that our streets are as lit as possible, are as safe to walk and ride and transit and be in as possible. That's the limit of the core services of a council. The rest of it is heavy lobbying and negotiation with central government to say, hey, we need more help. We need you on the streets. We need you to help stop this crime that's happening because all we're doing is trying to defend against it by helping these businesses against it. And that's, that's basically where I personally feel the limit is. I think two things on that. So one is that you know, the wheels of council turn slowly the wheels of Wellington turn ever so much slower. So getting some things out of Wellington takes a lot more time. So when there is a, a sort of particular situation like we're having right now, we need to a bit more agility in how we're able to respond. So for two years, we've been lobbying Wellington about a, a crime wave from COVID. And suddenly it's urgent now in the media uh, from, from Wellington, but it's actually been a, a very slow burn. So that's why I'd say on that. But second of all, um, I think council has a very significant role to play in terms of planning because, you know, in parts of Auckland, and Newmarket's a great example, where we've got hundreds and, or thousands of apartment units being, uh, you know, being consented with little regard for the needs of the communities who are going to live in those areas from a recreational perspective. For example, families moving in double grammar zone, where are the kids gonna play? Are they gonna hang out around the train station and the shopping center and cause havoc? So that's just all I'd say on that. So I think council has quite a big role to play in, in overall safety. That, that comes down to providing the safe streets, yes. Yeah, cool. Uh, second of all, business associations like my delightful colleagues on this call this morning. Uh, we are part of the Business Improvement District Program, which is funded by a targeted rate on the rates of the commercial properties in the area, uh, democratically approved by ballot, governed by a board under a constitution. We're all incorporated societies. What are your thoughts on the bid program? Oh, it's great. 
I've had a bit to do with them over the years, um, especially when I was in engineering and, well, not with the bid program back then, but dealing with uh, business entities and knowing and understanding what they want. And that transfers straight over to this bid system, which I think is great. A targeted rate is fine. Having the board, which is democratically elected, is fine. The whole system, if someone doesn't like it, well, then just change your vote. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a pretty simple system. It's just like going for council. I have no, no issues with it. I think it's good. There should probably be a more of a, you don't hear about it. Unless you're directly involved, you don't know that they exist. The general population would have very little idea that they exist. So maybe those these bids should be more open and saying, hey, this is what we're doing and why we're doing it, because we want to look after you. We want to make our businesses successful. We want to look after you to go out there more, be more communicative and, and, and shout from the rooftops about what's going on. It might help. I think probably the ones on this call would probably argue we do quite a lot for social media and communications with our consumer demographic for the various bids we represent. Yeah, yeah. And see, but there's a point there because I think a lot of people struggle with social media because they don't understand that it's social. And and people want it to be social. You've got to be you've got to be a, a lot more casual and relaxed and real on social media rather than the business approach on social media. And then you get the wider spread, you get more people interacting with you and, and anyway that's that's not that's not my job to sort that but it's just the point here yeah. uh so what infrastructure projects do you think need to be championed in wellington to improve auckland infrastructure in wellington no what infrastructure projects need to be championed in wellington on behalf of auckland i get you i get you uh definitely the roading i think is a is a major problem The, the stormwaters are being slowly sorted. That's fantastic. And, and that's got to keep going because that's a core service. They've been upgrading all the broadband. Again, brilliant. It took me two years longer than everyone else around me, but that's fine. I've got it too, and I'm, I'm wrapped with it. Wellington needs to get our traffic movement happening again because congestion has proven to cause more emissions. We've got to stop congestion. Now, I get the argument, you build more roads, you get more cars, but you free up the existing ones rather than restricting them. That's what the government has to do with NZTA onto Auckland Transport to say, hey, let's stop restricting flow. That's an infrastructure problem. I want a mill road, hill road. I want transport out to Kumu. We've got to get better transport, more efficient up north. We must have a bridge crossing again. We've got to do something about that harbour crossing. And there's probably four or five different ideas on the table at the moment. Each one of them has merit, pros and cons. I like a tunnel. There's cons with a tunnel. Um, maybe we go both. Maybe we have another bridge and a tunnel. Maybe we have one out further west and we go over there to put an extra bridge across over that area. Maybe there has to be one across the Manukau further down to bring people in from Pukekohe. So those sort of things, they need to be looked at. What scares me though, is you get scenarios like light rail, where the cost has absolutely ballooned and the logistics and the pragmatic idea of it has disappeared. It makes no sense. And that's where a problem can be. So uh, infrastructure, <laughs> Three waters, yeah, infrastructure. To me, we've got to sort some of those dangerous road areas. That's that's a, a big thing. But but look, our storm waters are uh, being developed. We're developing better water tanks. We're developing more. We're getting water out of the Waikato River. Things are, are, are ticking along in those sort of aspects. We can just keep going with them. Okay. And finally, for me, uh, despite sort of COVID and lockdowns and the current sort of, you know, wave of brain drain as everyone leaves New Zealand to go overseas to the OE after a couple of years, uh, Auckland ultimately will continue its growth trajectory. We are a very attractive city in the Pacific. Uh, and how do you think council could better support the growth of Auckland going forward? That's quite a broad question. I like the idea of building up for accommodation, not out. I, I like that, especially in the in the zones where there is a traffic hub, Newland, Newmarket, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's fantastic. Henderson, 
you put the apartments up, you get more people into a small space, you can make things better. Uh, the low density dwelling with the single housing sprawl, I'm starting to get extremely concerned about, especially further down in South and down in Franklin on the outskirts of Rodney, where they're putting in tens of thousands of houses in areas that don't have the infrastructure to cope with it. They don't have the water, they don't have the, the roading, they don't have the public transport. That's a real big problem. So I think Auckland Council needs to think about that hard. The problem is I don't think they have the right to say no to a lot of those developments. They, they got to approve them. They, they legally can't say, nope, we're not allowing you to do that here because we want to build up closer to a transport hub. I'd have to check with the legal team on what is and isn't allowed on that sort of thing. But that's my belief. We've got to go up. So that's the, uh, a major support in regards to housing. Then it comes down, that should by default solve a lot of the transport issues for them if we're building bulk up around transport hubs, which, which is the plan that's currently underway. So, so there's nothing needed from me dramatically to say, hey, we should do it differently. Everything else already exists, really, when it comes down to community groups looking after the immigrants, when it comes to um, the council facilities are already there. So there's not really a lot else that, that Auckland Council has to do apart from really focus. <laughs> I keep harping it, the core services and making sure that the housing is done smartly. I must say, I don't like the idea of, of heritage housing disappearing. I, I don't like that. I think we need to keep it. Right, thank you, Craig. Pass it over to my colleague Cheryl and Parnell with any follow-up questions. Hi, Craig. Um, Hi. You've spoken a lot about core services. So um, although you've spoken about Auckland Transport, I haven't read or heard anything from you about your view on Auckland Unlimited as a CCO, and especially their role um, pre-COVID in bringing big events to Auckland and kind of putting Auckland on the map. What is, what is your view of that, of them and their, their services in terms of your philosophy? Yeah, well, I had a, a hate on for RFA in the old days. I felt they were way out of touch with what was needed. And, and when I heard that there was going to be a, an investigation into how the CCOs operated and then they turned a TED and RFA into Unlimited, I was like, yeah, actually, this is good. We might have a single entity that will do their job of promoting Auckland. That's their job. We've got to have that. We've got to promote ourselves. The problem for Auckland, though, is it's not really a tourism spot. That's part of the hassle we've got. They come into Auckland and then they disappear to the rest of the country, and you can't blame them. I mean, it's what it is, and, and we can't try and change that too much because there's not a lot we can do about it. So um, uh, Auckland Unlimited have a role. Until I'm on the inside, I don't know if that role is efficient, though, whether they're actually spending money well in the right places or whether they're burning through it and not getting any uh, achievement out of it. Again, yeah, like I say, excluding COVID. Um, but yes, we need a place for that kind of CCO. It's important for, maybe it doesn't have to be a CCO. It could just be a department, for so to speak. But yes, we need a promotion arm, should it be said, for Auckland Council, all for that. Regards to the other CCOs, just, just quickly, I think they need to be brought under exactly what they are, council control, because they're not. They're left to their own uh, Jews at the moment. And that worries me. Ekepanuku, uh, every time I, I scour the social media to see what's been happening around our city and they're involved, uh, a lot of things don't make sense. And when I've read reports from other councillors online over the last couple of years about what they're doing with uh, selling Auckland property and, and doing things that made me realize that basically Panuku has become a almost a, a development, personal development, property development using ratepayer money. And that started to concern me. So we need to give them a full audit. And that's got to happen. Thank you. And, and it's by the way, it is doable. There is a system in place. There are tools already in place inside Auckland Council to do that. They're just not being used. There's a committee that exists, uh, appointments, performance review committee. Their job is to determine the board, to make the CCOs accountable, and to provide the letter of intent of what we want. And at this point, I don't believe that's being done properly, and it's something I'll look into pretty heavily. Thanks, Greg. Nothing more from me. Thanks, Cheryl. 
Uh, so thank you very much, Craig. That brings us to an end of this for this morning. And just to follow up on uh, the comments regarding the um, letter or the, the notarized letter about Shane from AT, if you can pass it on to our media panel, if I can facilitate that if you haven't got the details, I'm sure you've got them. I'm sure you're easy to get hold of anyway. Uh, thank you to our panel, Simon from The Herald, Brent from Business Desk and Todd from Stuff. I think uh, we didn't quite get hold of Mark this morning. He's obviously tied up with some breaking story. I don't know what that could be. Uh, but thanks to also to my colleagues, Cheryl and Parnell, uh, Viv and Ponsonby, Jamie and Kai, and Happy Road, and Brent in Uptown. Um, I've really enjoyed the series. It'll be posted online uh, very shortly on newmarket.co.nz, and you'll be able to watch uh, all five of the mayoral candidate webinars to see uh, what they've all had to say about their vision for Auckland. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And thank you, media panel. Once again, you guys have been awesome. Thanks. Thank you, Mark and Cheryl. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Craig.